Welcome, everyone. I'm Jerry Bone, and I currently serve as president of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. We're glad you chose to spend some time with us tonight as we learn more about grazing management in the final webinar in our three-part series on grazing forages and technology tools for grazers. We're proud to be partnering on this series with experts from across the country, including many fine land-grant universities and also many producers that have been recognized as outstanding stewards of land, forage, and cattle, as well as some great sponsors who bring solutions to everyday problems or needs. As a participant, your line will be muted, but feel free to type in questions in the question box on your screen during the webinar. And at the end of the presentation, we will get to as many of those as time will allow. If you have trouble with your technology, or if you're joining us only for the audio, the webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing in a few days at ncba.org. Just look for the producer tab on the website. The webinar tonight, titled Grazing Tools of the Trade, will feature John Griggs, manager of Maggie Creek Ranch in Elko County, Nevada. Maggie Creek is a for forage-based cow-calf and stalker operation in a high desert environment. Maggie Creek was awarded an Environmental Stewardship Award in 2017. Colby Buck grew up on a commercial Black Angus operation in Northeastern Colorado and currently serves as U.S. Account Manager for AgriWeb, a livestock farm management solutions software company. Dr. Vanessa Corrier Olson is a forage extension specialist with Texas A&M University and she will kick things off for us tonight. Dr. Olson, welcome, and the floor is yours for your first uh, presentation. All right, good evening, everyone. My name is Vanessa Corrier Olson. I am the Forage Extension Specialist with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension, and I'm located in East Texas in Overton, about two hours east of Dallas, just to give you an idea of where I'm located in Texas. Um, for me, where I'm located in Texas, it is high forage production. Since we are, I am located east of I-35, we have fairly high average annual rainfall. So it is great for forage production. And a majority of our forage base is going to be improved forages such as Bermuda grass, Bahia grass. And of course, there is still the utilization of many of our native grass species uh, for us in, in various parts of Texas. So as we talk about grazing tools of the of the trade um, and the very first thing that we need to talk about as far as our is our forage systems of course we're going to talk about the tools that we can use within those forage systems but we also have to talk about and think about what our goals are for ourselves or as individuals within our forage systems or for our forage systems so our overall forage system goal, no matter where we are located in the states or what our forage base is, should be to provide the quantity as well as the quality or nutritive value of forage needed to meet cattle nutritional needs or other livestock species, maybe horses, goats, sheep, what have you, throughout the year as well as from year to year. So not just thinking short term, but also thinking long term for multiple seasons of continued production in the livestock business. Our forage systems should do a multitude of things, obviously provide quality and quantity of forage. Um, our forage systems should also ensure survival of the forage stand, um, especially for perennial forages, that we support that perennial and persistent growth to maintain our forage systems once again, well beyond just a single season or a single year. We also want them hey, to Dr. be Olson. economical. Yes. I hate to interrupt, but I'm getting a white screen only right now. Okay. Uh, could you advance? There we go. Now we're good. Thanks. Okay. Sorry about that. I'm not it's sure what coming happened. coming through now. No, okay. me either, but, but we're all good now. Thanks. Okay. So once again, forage systems should also be economical. And as all the speakers talked today about some tools of, of grazing trade. Many of them will help us be more, much more economical as well as efficient within our forage systems. 
And then they should also be complementary to other ranch goals. For many of us, our goals within our ranches goes beyond just forage production and livestock production. Um, and they should also match our environment and soil type. I am in Texas. Many of you are located in other states and have different environmental conditions and also likely have different soil types. Just within the state of Texas, there is a large diversity in soil type. So even as I visit with producers, it's important that I understand where they're located, their environmental constraints, and the soil type that they're utilizing to support their, or that they have available to support their forage system. Some of our other objectives could be to support, develop, or protect wildlife habitat that is of great interest for many Texans, whether it's quail, white-tailed deer, turkeys, um, what have you. Um, some other objectives might be to sequester carbon from the atmosphere that has become very popular and of interest among a lot of researchers as well as many producers. Reduce soil erosion from wind or even water. Um, and with soil erosion, we can have loss of nutrients that can be damaging to our environment. And as forage producers, we should be good stewards of our environment and of our resources and our natural resources. We also want to protect water quality and quantity. Depending on where you're located in the United States, water is a big, it's a big issue uh, for a lot of producers in Texas, especially in the panhandle. Uh, water availability and quality of water is, is a long-term concern among farmers and ranchers. We also want to protect animal health and welfare, as well as produce quality and safe animal products for our consumers if we are in the livestock industry. And we may be interested in offering hunting or ecotourism, eco or even have our own personal recreational opportunities. So our goals may not be singular as far as forage production and livestock production. So thinking about our overall goals within our property um, can help us make and utilize some of these grazing tools we're going to talk about moving forward um, to be very effective and efficient forage producers. So when you talk about grazing systems, there are a lot, it's basically an integration of multiple parts. Of course, we think about the animal and the plant. That's obvious within a grazing system. We have forage, we have livestock that are grazing those forages, but we also have to think about the soil, our environment, such as our soil type, our rainfall, lack of rainfall, temperatures, just environmental conditions, and even mother nature in extreme conditions, um, as far as storms, what have you. And then our management. As individuals, how are we going to manage our property? How do we desire to manage our property and what resources do we have? Um, and we're going to give you a multitude of tools that can help you be better stewards, better managers of your grazing systems and of your forage systems. So the first tool I'm gonna to talk about today and probably one of the, in my opinion, a very important tool, a very simple tool, um, but it can have a huge impact on our forage production systems and that is soil testing. Um, in regards to how often should we collect soil samples, in my opinion, if you are in a grazing, you have a grazing system, I recommend typically every two to three years. Anytime you are looking to incorporate new forages or make changes within your forage systems, then I would recommend starting that process with a soil analysis to determine if you need to make amendments to support that, that change or that shift in your production system. A soil test is gonna give you credit for any natural existing nutrients within your soils. We have a variety of soil types. Some soils hold on to nutrients um, much more readily, have a higher cation exchange capacity and the ability to hold on to those nutrients as opposed to very sandy soils. It will also give you credit for carryover of nutrients. In a pasture system, we're recycling a lot of those nutrients. Our livestock cattle only keep about 10 to 30% of the nutrients they ingest. The other 70 to 90 are going to be recycled back into your pasture system through their feces and urine. So you'll get credit for that um, by collecting soil samples and having them analyzed and knowing exactly what you need to add or what you don't need to add to promote forage production and persistence. For there are a multitude of locations where you can have soil samples analyzed. Universities, of course, are an excellent resource. 
Um, they may frequently be a little bit more economical compared to a larger laboratory, um, but you would need to investigate that within your state. But it is still going to be cheaper as opposed to compared to the expense of a buying nutrients that are not necessarily needed within your forage system. So for a routine soil analysis, you need to collect at least six inches of soil. Um, those can be collected with a multitude of tools, <clears throat> a sharpshooter, a shovel, or a soil probe. If you are going to be in the forage business for a long period of time, I think purchasing your own soil probe can be an economical choice and a great grazing tool, so to speak. Um, they come in a variety of, sh of sizes and expense. I think they can be well worth your investment and last you for years if taken care of. Um, in regards to how should we collect good soil samples, our soil analysis should be based on a composite sampling. So a representation of that entire pasture or that entire hay meadow. So my recommendation is to collect 12 to 15 cores from a variety of locations within that, within that management area or that pasture. A definition for management area would be a uniform field, so a single forage species or a portion of a field that is no, no larger than 40 to 50 acres. Um, so if you have you know, a thousand acre pasture, then that would need to be broken down into smaller components. We will naturally have some variation within our fields, maybe with soil type, as well as just maybe just natural um, differences, natural variation within that environment. So we want to make sure we're giving credit to some of that variation. You're gonna collect all of those cores in a clean plastic bucket, mix those thoroughly, and that will therefore create your composite sample. For most routine soil analysis, you're ultimately sending a pint of soil. Um, many labs will provide you with a bag for free or as well as the, the paperwork to fill out. Many labs, you can also locate their paperwork from their website, download it, fill it out, and put that pint of soil in your own bag um, and ship it to them directly. This is an example of what a soil analysis would look like from Texas A&M AgriLife um, Extension Soil Forage Water Testing Lab in College Station, where a routine soil analysis will give you your soil pH and your primary nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So there are a lot of essential nutrients for forage production. The primary ones are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. They're very important for improving yield, um, the amount of forage we're able to produce, as well as the nutritive value. Nitrogen will have a direct impact on crude protein content of our forages. And phosphorus and potassium will be important for root growth and development, as well as persistence of many of our forages, making our forages um, more drought tolerant, disease tolerant, um, and water, and very effective at using moisture or water. For some of our forages, they can be sensitive to soil pH, so that will be an important aspect of a soil analysis and making sure that your forages you are utilizing are adapted to your soil pH. Um, if they are not, you may need to make amendments with lime to improve your soil pH so that forage can be productive and persistent within your environment. So soil pH can also be a huge important factor as far as forage production and persistence. Our second grazing tool, even though it's we're talking about grazing, hay production is part of many of our forage systems. And even maybe when we're not grazing or we don't have adequate grazing, we are feeding that forage and that is often comes in the form of dry hay. Um, so our next grazing tool is forage testing or forage analysis, analyzing our forages for nutritive value. Obviously, if, we're, if we have livestock, our goal is to provide high quality forage for our livestock to meet their nutritional needs. Without forage analysis, we're not going to know if we are meeting their nutritional needs and we don't know how to um, adjust that, whether that is to buy supplement, supplemental feed or buy another forage source or provide another forage source. So primary role of forage and hay quality is crude protein, the measure of crude protein. Also energy, which we typically measure as total digestible nutrients. That is going to equate energy. Energy is very important for livestock production, of course. Obviously we want our forages to be palatable as well as free of or have minimal amounts of nitrates or other potential toxic compounds. 
free of mold, weeds, and brush, as well as foreign objects. Um, so forage intake is going to be heavily influenced by forage quality. As our forage quality declines, forage intake will decrease. So a low quality forage will lead to a lower intake and therefore needing additional supplementation or other feeds to fill in those gaps. A higher quality forage, we're gonna see a higher intake. Some general hay intake guidelines for, for cattle. A dry gestating cow typically is gonna consume 1.8 to 2% of her body weight. A lactating cow obviously um, has higher nutrient requirements and is going to consume a lot more hay, um, two to 3% to two to 5% of her body weight. So their consumption is going to be based on nutritive value or the quality of that forage, as well as it's going to be based on a percentage of their body weight. In regards to how to collect forage samples, um, we need to sample each load or cutting. If you are in the hay production business, if you're producing your own hay, if you are buying hay from someone, I would recommend making sure that you know that all of the hay you are purchasing is from a single load or a single cutting or one specific field. You're gonna make one composite sample, so very similar to soil testing. However, you're gonna collect samples from, or cores from about 10% of those bales, and those should be randomly selected. Um, even if, whether they're, even as they're coming, if they're coming straight out of the field, still make sure that you are selecting those randomly. Once again, you will have variation within that field. Once that you have collected a composite from the 10% of those bales, you would mix those and create a composite sample that would then be sent to a forage lab. There are a lot of forage labs across the United States. If you are working with a nutritionist to help develop a feed program for your animals, I recommend asking them which lab they recommend using. They may have one that they are more familiar with as far as their testing protocols and that they feel confident in those results. Many of our universities ha also have forage testing labs, but once again, if you're working with a nutritionist, um, ask for their recommendation. Typically what it should be requested for a forage analysis, dry matter, um, crude protein, and some measure of energy such as TDN, um, and also a measure of fiber. NDF, which stands for neutral detergent fiber, is a, a measure of the amount of fiber and somewhat digestible and less digestible components of that forage. Another option or another good measure of energy is the in vitro true digestibility. You can also measure often for other minerals or other toxic compounds that can help you make more decisive decisions about your feeding program. So those are the two grazing tools that I wanted to introduce this evening. They're those, those are tools that we are very familiar with. Um, hopefully already as far as within our grazing systems. Soil testing and forage analysis are, are two very important tools that we should be utilizing on a regular basis. I do have a website if you're interested in my contact information or what I am doing at Texas A&M in Overton. Um, that is foragefacts.tamu.edu. I'm always happy to, to visit with anyone within Texas or outside who might potentially have any questions. I'll now pass the baton on over to um, Mr. John Griggs. Thank you, Dr. Olson. I appreciate you. Very good. <clears throat> so I'm John Griggs, the ranch manager for Maggie Creek Ranch just outside of Elko, Nevada. And I want to apologize to you folks up front. Uh, the intellectual quality of this webinar just took a sharp dive with with me taking over, but hopefully I can provide you with, with some thoughts to think about and to help you with your operation. And I know Kobe will pick us back up out of the gutter here in a minute. So Maggie Creek Ranch, Elko, Nevada is Nevada, Western United States, um, about halfway between Reno, Nevada and Salt Lake City, Utah. The red outline we're looking at here is the outside boundary of the headquarters unit of the of the place I call home, Maggie Creek Ranch. <clears throat> this application that I'm using to show you this is Google Earth, and it's the first thing I want to talk to you about. It's a it's a tool that I use almost daily, and it has multiple uses that I think are of benefit. Google Earth is a internet <clears throat> excuse me internet based 
a satellite imagery application. But what really makes it useful are the overlays that that you put on it, that, and those those stay with you. They they live on your computer. They're not part of what Google shares. Um, some of the some of the overlays you can you can get from the internet, uh, especially government agencies like uh, Bureau of Land Management has a pretty good one for public land. Shows you what's what's public and what's private. Can be slow to load though, so we may not get to see that one. <clears throat> but the overlays that that you can add um, can be essentially limitless. First first thing to think about are fences. So I've added here some of the internal fences that we have in there now. The also, the yellow squares are public land managed by the federal government, and that's a federal government overlay that I was able to access from the internet. So I take that off, and we're back to looking at some of the fences that, that we have. Really, really pretty simple to add those to your, to your overlay. Um, maybe I can show you how to do that sort of really quickly. So we're zooming in to right where I live right now. You can see one of the overlays is a push pin that's that's home and that's that's my house we're looking at. So the thing about Google Earth imagery is it's not real time. It's it's just whenever the satellite happened to be passing over um, whatever it is you want to look at. Um, and, and the way, a good way to make fences that and, and measure area is, is a tool in the upper bar here, a, a polygon. You can add a polygon. <clears throat> I, can, I can see the fences pretty well. I'm not sure that, that you can see them. Kind of knowing where they are helps you. But I'm going to add a fence here real quick in a small pasture adjacent to my house here. So I've added this polygon, and I can I can choose the style and color. So so in the area, I can choose that it's that it's not filled in. It's outlined. You can kind of see the you can kind of see the white outline. I can save that to my computer with the name of that pasture. And if I click this tab and pull down acres, it tells me that it's almost two acres. So, so a lot of things you can do with that polygon other than, than uh, measuring pastures and, and identifying fences. You can, uh, a thing that we, that we did here this spring is when we were thinking about, uh, thinking about <clears throat> as Dr. Olson talked about the forage that we were going to grow to feed hay, we had to decide what we would be able to irrigate this year and therefore what we would be able to fertilize because as you can imagine, fertilizer doesn't do any good if you don't have the water to put on it. So we identified this area of our, of our hay production meadows that we would fertilize. And and the thing I can do with this with this overlay now is by looking at properties, I can find the measurements of it, and I figure that almost 400 acres will be able to fertilize. But I can also send this file to uh, the folks that provide us fertilizer. They can not only know that that I need that amount of fertilizer, but they can also know that. You know, they can make a map from this or I can print a map and give to them and they can know exactly where I want that fertilizer applied. The other thing that goes along with this is, uh, you know, if you if you spray your fields with anything, you can uh, you can send this file to your to your aerial applicator and and he or she can plug it right into the to an iPad like device and and that goes into their airplane that 
puts them right on track for what you want done. It's witchcraft to me, voodoo science, but works pretty good and, and it's and it's pretty easy. Sure beats hand drawing lines on a map for your applicator to try to figure out what you want done. Another thing you can keep track of is is water developments. So in Nevada, uh, dry state in the union, very little free water. Um, water is always a limiting factor for us, whether it's water to irrigate with, water to grow forage with, or even stock water. <clears throat> a, a big a big bunch of our stock water is is pumped from the ground in wells, and you can you can use place marks to identify your wells, and you can also input data. So like here, we have this well that we call the dump well, and it has the certificate number with the state of Nevada. Often you have to access that for one reason or another. It has the depth of the well, the casing, and um, how the well is pumped. In this case, it's a 16 panel solar setup. Um, well, you can also get directions to here and from here, but <laughs> in this regard, it's not going to help you a whole lot. Okay, so that's that's Google Earth. A couple other things I'll show you on here is that will relate to my talk going forward is right next to the ranch you can see the town of Carlin, Nevada. And then on the other side of the ranch is the town of Elko, Nevada. And then on our western on our western edge here is is the biggest gold reserve in North America. <clears throat> Unfortunately, that doesn't carry over to Maggie Creek Ranch because I think uh, you can make a small fortune in ranching if you had a big gold reserve on it. But anyway, <clears throat> that uh, that means that there's a lot of a lot of public impact to our operation, and and keep that in mind as we talk about some of the things I'm going to talk to you about. So before we leave outer space, another tool that I want to talk to you about is uh, is what happens after you graze. Dr. Olson talked to you about uh, uh, testing your soil and testing your forage before you graze it. <clears throat> after you graze it, I think it's pretty important to have monitoring data. And if you're a public lands rancher in the West, it's really important that you have monitoring data, or at least that you track what the agency that is your host, what they what they record as monitoring data because really big decisions about our grazing permit and our ability to graze cattle on public lands are based a lot on monitoring data of past years grazing seasons. And and for the agencies at this point, the the uh, standard for them is is on the ground um line set uh, uh, you know point point monitoring actually actually counting uh, species of plants in a transect in a specific area and and that's that's good hard data but it's not it's not landscape level stuff and it and it often doesn't tell the full picture the the thing the technology that's sort of coming on board now is is uh, remote sensing done with in this case real time imagery from satellites that's manipulated by by a company or an agency that can that can um, sort of tell you what you're looking at. Open range consulting here in this map is is who put this together for us and. And what I wanted 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 to know as a grazier is what what is the trend in cheatgrass? Cheatgrass is an annual invasive in the West that that when it's cured it it burns like gasoline and it makes wildland fire um, go from manageable to catastrophic depending on the cheatgrass component. Cheatgrass makes 
fire is large and uncontrollable, and it's and it's pretty low value of forage quality. So I I I as a grazier, I want to know what my current cover is of cheatgrass, but I want to know the trend as well. Am I gaining cheatgrass, which which would which may mean that I need to adjust how I graze, or am I um, out, am I allowing native perennials and annuals to out compete cheatgrass by how I graze it? And so this this map that you see goes from green to red, green being no cheatgrass and dark red being greater than 50% cheatgrass cover. And this was <clears throat> obviously uh, a space-based satellite imagery that was manipulated through com computer software to to measure the reflectivity of the plants and, and earth that that are there to be able to tell me what that what that crop you know what that cover of cheatgrass is. Um, interesting to note that the darker green blob sort of in the middle of this of this image is actually where a fire occurred earlier in that year. So it shows no cheatgrass there because it burned up. Um, it, it's it's not yet acceptable for government agencies. They need they need more specific to the meter of what what's there. I th I think we'll get there. I think I think um, these companies and agencies will figure out how to do it. But for a grazier, it it can tell us important things like bare ground cover. Um, brush and forbs cover, even even to some extent perennial versus annual grass cover, and, and these kind of things I think are pretty important. And the trends of them, you know, what you're gaining and what what you're losing are are really important. So, pretty pretty uh, pretty valuable technology, and you know we're looking at I don't know something like fifteen thousand acres in the colored area here, and you know, when you when you start thinking about putting people on the ground to try to monitor that, the counter, the cost of that, and the time that for you to do it yourself gets pretty prohibitive. But but something like this can be done for you know five to fifteen cents an acre, which is still significant. But but it's landscape level and and pretty valuable data. Next thing I kind of want to talk to you about, you know, when we when we think about how important water is to us and and when we're trying to think about how do we how do we access really remote rugged rangelands that that have no water and and scatter cows across that you know to make maximize the benefit and use and not harm the range that we graze on um, we think about wells in remote areas and and that's that's good for cattle distribution, but but then it makes it hard to get to and hard to you know hard to fuel a generator up or fuel a, a pump motor up or or things like that. Solar is a technology that you know has been around for a while, and and probably a lot of you are are using things like this to pump water, but but a lot of tools that come with solar are are really uh, really making making uh, this tool easier, better, and and more efficient for us. So this this is a so stock water solar setup that six panels about uh, a 400 foot deep well. You can see just below the panels, there's a controller box that, that controls the pump motor for a submersible pump, um, about 20,000 gallons of storage. Storage is pretty important for these setups because you're only pumping in the daylight hours. <clears throat> this setup here is, is kind of criti critical to us. It's, it's an area, it's, it's where we first start our, our grazing regime um, in the spring of the year. This, this is a picture taken when we, when we kind of upgraded it. So 16 panel setup because it's a, almost a 600 foot deep submersible pump. Um, pretty large storage in the in the drinker and and fair storage in the troughs up here. We can we can 
water something like 700 cows here in the spring of the year before it gets really hot and and do pretty well the thing the thing about this setup that why i included in the talk is seven eight hundred cows you know if we get a pretty cloudy day or if we're out pretty early before days get long cows will get ahead of this but but the nice part about this system is we can put a generator on this setup and we can pump it overnight and that controller that i mentioned in the previous slide that will that will switch from the generator that'll switch off the generator or the generator run out of gas switch off and switch back to solar so virtually that pumps pumping around the clock with with not as much gas as it normally would take with with a gas powered pump alone here's here's a setup that we have in a really remote area it takes takes you about a half a day by a pickup or ATV to get to this location. Um, really rough road, really hard to get to, really kind of a pain in the rear. Uh, this particular setup though, is in an area that has cell service coverage and it's got this setup that you can kind of see. Actually, this, this black rectangle here is from an email that I get every morning that tells me currently I'm at 19% capacity of storage in this in this uh, in the storage um, tank, and it also tells me that right now minimal cattle there they're using about a tenth of a percent of that storage every day. Obviously, you know things can happen, and you want to get out there and make sure that this trough right here is actually full and has water, and these cows have water, but but maybe you can do that every three or four days and and these numbers here will give you clues that that things are okay um, really kind of saves wear and tear on a pickup that way last thing to think about with with solar is that <clears throat> arguably the most important tool for a grazier is is people people living and managing the cattle that are grazing and in Nevada, remote ranges, it's hard to have people that sort of live with your cattle. Um, you know, there's there's vast stretches where there's there's no power, electricity, and and not much water, and and hard to hard to get people to live there. But on the north end of this operation, we have this camp we call Red House, and it it does not have electricity. Um, it's a long way to the nearest power pole from here. It used to be powered by an old witty generator that would run 24 hours a day. And you can imagine what that diesel bill could be like. Something, you know, even when diesel prices were under two dollars, it was three, four thousand dollar a month bill to to power that camp. Well, now we have this what 24 panel solar setup. And in this outbuilding that you can kind of see in the lower left hand corner, there's batteries that are charged every day. And that that setup will will power two houses with small families and several outbuildings, including the barn that you can see in the lower right hand picture. And we we can mostly get by with that year round. Some sometimes in the winter, we may have to fire the generator up for a few hours to charge of those batteries when when uh, you know it's cloudy and the days are short but for the most part it works pretty good and and very little maintenance too you know check water level in the battery occasionally and and that's about it maybe broom the snow off the off the solar panels when you need to but but that's about it pretty pretty useful technology um, a really big cost savings when you compare it to diesel and a generator and makes the place much more habitable for the people that live there. Probably the last thing I want to talk to you about is, is just this. <clears throat> we used to call them game cameras or trail cameras. Now they're sort of remote security cameras. This particular camera has a cell-based connection and it will, it will email me pictures 
whenever I want it to, or it will email me pictures when it's triggered by by the uh, motion detector, and and it will do that night or day, and the and the pictures are pretty good quality either either way. Um, we we just started started using these, haven't haven't caught anybody in the act, so to speak. But but our neighbors neighbors to the south of us had had this set up in a pasture that that was being vandalized on a regular basis. And a and a person came in a pickup and <clears throat> tore down this camera and tore out the SIM card in it and ruined the camera but not before the cell connection sent pictures of his pickup um and it from a couple of different angles and last i heard they were pursuing the person that did that but but the but the pickup was unique enough that i'm fairly confident that they'll catch him <clears throat> in our in our areas as i told you we we have uh, fairly big public impacts and and nevada has pretty lax trespass laws so that the dedicated trespasser can find a way onto private property and and have a pretty good excuse for being there in that he couldn't find a no trespassing sign or or whatever it takes so these cameras and just the thought of these cameras are are of a big help to us i think that you know in my in my career 30 years of being maggie creek ranch i put up a lot of no trespassing signs that eventually get stolen or shot up but the signs that say video cameras and use on the premises are the ones that last longest and get it shot up the least so just the thought of these cameras being out there has been been a big help to to uh, remind our urban neighbors that people are out here and fences and and rescue stock tanks are important to us so I believe that's it for me. You probably have questions afterwards. I, I'll stick around to answer them before I lope off into the sunset. But I'd like to kick it over to Kobe that will obviously raise our intellectual level back up again. And, and thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks, John. I, I think that you brought up a pretty exciting point. I mean, there are different types of technology that can be applicable even if they're not meant for this type of use like those game cameras they really help whether it's security of mind or whether it's just uh looking for cattle uh, as we continue to grow into a new age of livestock management i loved looking and, and seeing how you utilize maps and and hope to build on on some of the information that you have provided but before we get there um I'm just gonna do a quick seventh inning stretch. I have a question for a lot of our people tuning in today. I believe that there's a chat function on your, your webinar. So real quickly, I mean, when we talk about grazing, there are so many different geographies, so many different environments. Uh, John has a very different environment than what Vanessa is used to. We operate in a completely different environment than either of those two. So. Real quickly, uh, anyone and everyone willing, uh, just kind of jump in and engage with us. And just tell us where you think these locations are uh, and just give us a best guesstimate. Uh, I'll just leave this on my screen for a bit and then jump in and introduce myself before we revisit this because these are all geographies that we provide grazing assistance with, with a multi multitude of producers large and small. So next, just to briefly introduce myself, I, Jerry did a great job at first, but my name's Kobe Buck. I grew up on a, Ray Ranch is the name of our company, out in northeastern Colorado. We kind of straddled the Nebraska-Colorado state line about three miles north of where Colorado, Nebraska, and Kansas all meet. This picture is a once-in-the-decade picture for our country uh, with clouds in the sky and green grass out there in the backyard. We primarily raise commercial Black Angus calves. Uh, that's been our bread and butter, but as we look at the markets and try to figure out what works best in our environment, we start to think, where's the best uh, 
best way to flex our operation? Do we diversify more into stockers? The cattle industry is near and dear to, to our family's heart. I uh, was fortunate enough to grow up as a fifth generation cattle rancher. Uh, the first and second generation of our family were both uh, presidents of the ANLA, which preceded the NCBA. They served during the 1930s and 1950s. So really trying to look out for producers and producers' interests is, is what we value most when it comes to this industry. After going to college on the East Coast, I spent about five years in the, in the finance and, and energy and commodity space, focusing on supply chains and logistics for ag and, and energy before getting the opportunity to come back to the industry that I love and join AgriWeb as we launched in Australia, or launched in the United States. We're originally Australian. But enough about me, uh, I'll jump into the answers to these questions. So surprisingly enough, I, I was shocked as well, but the, those landscapes look a lot like the geographies of the United States, but this is a global footprint briefly of the different designs and different locations that we have experienced grazing in. The Flinders Ranges in Australia, North South Australia area, looks a lot like Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada, uh, right up there in John's country. The Plains of North Texas is similar to the country that I grew up in. And then Wales in the UK probably resembles more so the Southeast, the Midwest, and the lower uh, East Texas, perhaps, area that the, Van the Vanessa is used to. We provided consult consultations. And we've worked with operations, both large and small, across these three geographies as a global business and across the U.S., whether it's from Oregon to Florida or Louisiana to Arizona and up in Vermont, we have looked at grazing protocols across the geography. Just a little bit of background about AgriWeb, because I think that's probably a pretty big question most people have right now is, AgriWeb was a, a company originally founded seven years ago uh, in Australia by three kids that grew up on ranches and really saw some pain points on how can we bring technology to this industry. As John mentioned, they can really see massive gains, whether it's your power in your house or controlling your grazing. Today, we have about 14 million head of livestock across 6,000 operations globally, and that comprises over 100 million acres. But those are just small stats and, and we're excited where the US is going. Right now we have about 150, closer maybe to 200 operations with about 150,000 head of cattle and comprising a, maybe five or six million acres uh, of grazable land. AgriWeb's just uh, the next step, what we believe in, in the holistic management scale, uh, drags and drops, it works completely offline, it fits in your pocket just like the calving book. Hopefully, fingers crossed, this isn't always the case, but we love those NCBA calving books. We don't want to get rid of them, but if those go through the wash or get lost in the pasture, a valuable source of information is just gone forever. By having it on your phone, storing it in the cloud, it allows you to capture your grazing protocol, uh, your animal performance, and your overall financials in a pretty ironclad way. So we work across the, the ranching operations, holistically uh, look at animal performance, business management, and pasture and grazing protocols all at once. That hay bill that you throw out decreases the amount of forage, native forage a cow needs, has a cost associated with it that should be accrued on those cows, and has a nutritional value, as Vanessa mentioned, that goes toward that cow producing a healthy calf. But today, we'll just focus primarily on the pasture management. Just some bit of background on AgriWeb overall, but to kick things off, really, I want to talk about a free tool that's not associated with us, but I find myself looking at this on a daily basis as I work with producers or work for the grazing plan that uh, our family deploys in Eastern Colorado. And that's the NRCS web, web uh, soil survey link. So if we click into this and fingers crossed that this works, this is a, a database that the NRCS has compiled over the years and decades. We look at it as a valuable way to benchmark our forage 
depending on the year, depending on the precipitation, and depending on if we're looking at a new lease, we, we analyze the forage capacity. If I step into it, it's very similar to the satellite imagery maps that, that John just referenced. But in here, we can set an area of interest pretty easily. So I'll zoom into my neck of the woods. You can see the small town of Rays right here. And just set an AOI, an area of interest, to the general vicinity that I call home. This pulls up, it'll give me a warning sign because we're across two counties and two states. I can close out of that, but we can take a look at the soil design and the soil design in respects of forage productivity of this area of interest. So briefly click into the Soil Data Explorer. And then I know this pretty well at this point, but what you're looking for is vegetative productivity. And then down here, we run a lot of native grass. You can see there are some center pivots in our area, so maybe they have more irrigated crops, but we run a lot of native grass. And I just wanna look at my forage production on a normal year. A normal year for us is about 17 inches of rainfall, but in reality, you never really have a normal year. You either have above average rainfall or substantially below average rainfall. So just setting this rating, we can look at the view the sandy, uh, the sandy, very fine sand hills north of our house, this little riverbed bottom uh, that cuts us in half. And then you can see maybe some lo loaming, more canyonous designs south of uh, the highway. This is all broken down into specific uh, soil types based off of the NRCS. But by just scrolling through here, we can see the different soil types, um, the slopes that they have, and the potential forage capacity that they have during an average year. So looking at this, we can see Hagler very fine sandy loam has roughly 2,300 pounds of dry matter per acre, but only makes up about 70 acres in this area of interest. The total acreage in this area of interest is about 36,000. So maybe one paddock or pasture's worth of grazing just right there at your fingertips. But as we scroll down, the vast majority drops to um, 1,900, 2,000 pounds. And you can see also 1,100 pounds making an appearance. But being able to look at this based off of a county by county basis, an acre by acre basis, and a rating on an average year gives us an insight of how much forage can we potentially grow. So definitely wanted to share this. I encourage each and every one of you uh, to jump into this. And it's a great benchmark to use. If you're not, if you haven't done a recent soil test, if you haven't done a recent forage calculation or forage test that Vanessa mentioned. Going back to my presentation, I'll see if this, I can just step this in. This is how I typically analyze a lot of the forage for, for our ranch and for ranches across the country, whether it's California, Louisiana, um, somewhere in the Midwest, North Dakota. I pull out their area of interest based off of their range map and look at just unfavorable, favor, uh, average and above average rainfall precipitation. From here, we can do a, a little bit of napkin math and do a weighted average forage production per acre. Timesing that by the, the area of interest gives us a total forage amount that we have available theoretically by just doing a, this is an unfavorable year demonstration. We're only gonna utilize that grass by 40%. Uh, and then taking the 40% the of 21 million and dividing it by 26 pounds of dry matter per animal unit, we get animal unit days. Simply dividing that by the number of days you uh, intend to graze cattle gives you that annual carrying capacity for, for your land uh, in an unfavorable year. Again, you can see the soil design and the soil uh, difference on this forage productivity used by the Web Soil Survey. And as we get rainfall, as we react and become proactive about how much rain we are, we have and adjust our carrying capacity or our stocking rate accordingly, you can start to see how this operation flexes. So, in an average year, 
this is a 21,000 acre ranch. It's quite large, but the, the principles carry through whether you're 50 acres or 50,000 acres. During an average year of 17 inches of rainfall, we can see that we have almost 800,000 animal unit days. And the annual stocking rate or carrying capacity comes to 2,200. 2,200 thousand pound animals that consume 26 pounds of forage a day. And this is a once in a decade, once in a couple of decades uh, scenario. But if we do have that favorable year with a couple of monsoons coming in, uh, we can really look at what would be the maximum potential of our operation. How many cattle can we run? Uh, sometimes this often requires good years before it because a lot of that precipitation in our experience goes to land recovery if it's had a couple of years of setback. So fingers crossed in that once in a decade year, how much forage do you provide on this operation? You can see in this case, our utilization also goes up because 60% of a lot is up still more than 40% of a little. Uh, so we still keep uh, uh, enough cover and residual forage to protect the land, uh, allow that phase two uh, regrowth and allow the residual forage to cover the land to prevent blowouts. But we're looking at over a million, close to 1.4 million animal unit days, and that annualizes out into 3,700 animal units that this operation could carry. This is really a lot of our initial conversations when someone a producer reaches out to us and says, how many animals should I be able to graze? How can I improve my grazing protocols? Uh, and then also this map is pretty valuable because if you do have pretty uh, wild fluctuations in soil types like we do, you can look to fence off and subdivide more productive acres, more productive soil types from the sandy uh, soil north of our house where you can, where you have to be a little bit more gradual uh, when it comes to your grazing and your ro rotations. But the riverbed, we can graze it three times a year, flash graze that, that cheat grass, and then come back and try to keep everything in, into phase two. Our general, on, on our ranch, this is not our ranch, but on our ranch, our rotational design is typically, we try to subdivide pastures into 250 to 300 acre pastures and run 200 head at a time in those rotations. Fingers crossed, it depends on the precipitation, but each one of those units will have at least 10 to 15 pastures that they'll graze through. And we try to graze those pastures three times a year in a short interval. If it's a drought year, we expand the grazable paddocks or pastures to more uh, and we run fewer herds, but we have two, uh, two seasons of growth. We have the warm seasons and the cool seasons. The cool seasons are just coming on right now. We try to graze it once between now and maybe June 15th to get that cool season in phase two. And then we come back to it uh, or uh, come back to it in July and, and graze from July to September, August, November, if we have some, some uh, forage and in, in the climate's good. But two uh, hits on every rotation or average rotation ranges a lot during calving season, which is right now for us. We try to calve in, uh, during the mother nature time because as I think I was talking to Josh earlier and Colorado weather gets pretty hectic uh, throughout the year, April in included. We, we've probably gotten eight inches of snow just in the past two and a half weeks. So being able to slow rotations down and make sure the mother takes care of her calf, but once that calf is, is willing and able, we accelerate those movements to make sure that each pasture has at least 60 days rest, preferably 100 days rest is what we shoot to, uh, and, and target for. But that's a brief design of just a web soil survey. I encourage you to use it. And then the next topic is what we are doing at AgriWeb. So what we are doing at AgriWeb, it, aligns perfectly with these grazing tools and really shows you how to level up um, your, your grazing operation just using some basic technology. I think that our average age at AgriWeb is right at 60 across the globe. So we get a lot of people that come in naturally intimidated, but in reality, they can check the cattle markets on their phone. 
They can check Facebook on their phone. So checking their grazing protocol comes pretty easy to most operations. So what is AgriWeb? Well, it's a web portal and a mobile uh, device. You can input your water and infrastructure, your forage estimates, and the number of your cat head of cattle there. But on the day-to-day -day management side of things, you just drag and drop those cattle when you move them. The, the screen in the middle is a, a cute little animation that our marketing team drew up, but just those drag and drops allows us to look at days rest, allows us to look at days grazed, animal units per acre, um, and the long-term forage rates, forage benchmarks, and stocking rates overall. Here's just an example of mapping infrastructure. Uh, I think John did a great job of showing what infrastructure looks like and really knowing what's where. So that, that windmill that your grandfather installed in the late 60s, early 70s, it's about to tip over. You can have an exact location for that, an exact uh, record of the well depth. Um, any of that information and all of that information can be written down, updated along with its exact location. In my experience in our area, uh, if a rancher does have a few pennies to uh, uh, to use or invest in, they invest it in water because John hinted at this, but the best way to have uniform grazing is to have good infrastructure when it comes to water. And a cow will only go really a mile away from the closest water. So if we can strategically place these at cross points between our sections and rotations, it really allows us to do a much better job when it comes to uniform grazing. If you have a pasture where it's not ideal to put more water tanks in, you can always taper down the grazable acres in AgriWeb so you have a, a consistent benchmark of the, the, the grass that they're exposed to uh, any, uh, at any given pasture. Next, this is how I use that web soil survey on a weekly basis. So we work with our customers, our producers to put in their forage based off of the grass. You can see the, the lime green color is the sandy hills north of our house. The dark green is still that riverbed. And then the canyonist design south of the road is that, that light gray area. Each one of these colors designates a bracket of forage out there that can be consumable to cattle. Additionally, if you look closer, first and foremost, um, my father Rex will be quite happy. The gates are closed, so I'm doing at least one job right. But also looking at this, we can see the current forage estimate and our minimum forage target, how much we want to leave behind. From there, when we drop cattle in there, we'll calculate how many estimated days the cattle are good for before they likely need to be moved. At the end of the day, it's largely dependent on that trained eye that a lot of ranchers have just naturally, just looking at their grass and looking at their pasture appropriately. But we often find it, it's just a good gut check. It's a, a good peace of mind to have when you're looking at your operation at the end of the day, the end of the week, the end of the month, and looking at what needs to be done next, just being able to track the forage and the grazing days. And finally, you just put your cattle on there, drag them and drop them, move them on a regular basis. Uh, if you need to feed them, we can capture those records. If you have to treat a calf, um, you can rope them and then just put the number of mills that you put into that calf. All of that information seamlessly integrated into our holistic design. But the benchmark protocols that we talk to a lot of clients about, a lot of producers about is when it comes to grazing, get that forage estimate in there. Whether it's a web soil surveys, whether it is a satellite imagery that, that John has hinted at, or the, the soil test and the forage test that, that Vanessa encouraged each and every one of us to do. Just put those in and whether you have a take half, leave half approach or something slightly more sophisticated, you can also put a minimum forage target in there. At the end of the month, we ask you and, and we work with our our producers to adjust their forage according to the precipitation. So you're much more proactive on when you're gonna run out of grass or when do you need to sell those cattle. But day-to-day -day wise, you drag and drop the cattle and the rest is, is captured on our end. When you're at home, uh, once the sun goes down, 
you can always pull up grazing days remaining to see what needs to be done this week, what needs to be done tomorrow, and really allow you to, to be more proactive in getting out and, and making sure that your cattle and your grass are taken care of. On the back end, uh, rather than working in Excel spreadsheets, rather than uh, trying to take a lot of time to get to those answers that you're always uh, striving for, whether it's animal unit days per acre, whether it is your just basic stocking rate, the number of acres per cow, um, all of that we automatically parse for a lot of our producers. So when they're looking at their growth season grazing protocol, they can quickly jump into the browser, the web-based portal, print that report and look at where they went wrong and where they could have improved. This is all just a, a um, this is all just centered around making the life for, for the average producer a lot easier. We work with clients that have 50 acres, that have a thousand acres and have um, public land leases that comprise a lot more than that. It really just depends on each operation and figuring out the recipe and the data that matters to you. And then we handle a lot of the automation when it comes to looking at those reports. Uh, I think that this is a incredible, incredibly exciting time in agriculture. And I'm especially optimistic on where we're going. As John hinted, we have seen technology provide enormous benefits to date, but as satellites come through and give us more accurate forage readings, we can be much more proactive in, in navigating the, the volatility and precipitation. And we as a company look to help U.S. producers by managing their forage and helping integrate that information into an actionable design so that they can be better off, so that their cattle can be better off and their pocketbook can be better off. But I try to keep it pretty short. Thank you very much for your time. I'm just going to end with uh, a quote that I heard from Jim Gersh. He came out to Colorado and did a grazing seminar last August, and he said, how much of the potential we capture is up to management. So I really encourage everyone listening to jump in and to uh, look at the protocols that they can use and improve their overall grazing design. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kobe. Uh, and thank you to all three of our presenters tonight. NCBA is all about bringing relevant and practical information to our members and the industry. Our three presenters did a great job delivering the goals tonight. As we move into our question and answer session, I want to remind everyone to sign up for our next seminar webinar, How to Control Those Darn Pests. Registration opens tomorrow at ncba.org under the producer tab. I would also like to invite you all to attend our uh, national convention that will be from August 9th through 12th in Nashville, Tennessee at Opryland. Obviously, we had to move it from our normal time in February to August because of COVID, but from everything that we know right now, uh, we're going to be able to gather together again uh, as, a, uh, as a group of members uh, and celebrate our industry in Nashville in August. So please uh, join us. Our registration will open on June 1, so we'll be looking for that. Now let's get to our uh, questions that you might have. Thank you again for participating in the webinar tonight. And I'll now turn the uh, control of the webinar over to uh, Josh White, our NCBA staffer that will moderate the question and answer period. Josh. Thanks, Jerry. And hang around for just a second because I'm going to ask a question I may want you to weigh in on here. Uh, but um, yeah, great job, everyone. This has been a lot of fun and, and I hope everyone has learned something. Um, John, we've got a couple of questions for you as well. One of them I'm going to start with is the uh, plant and weed identification. You know, one of the, uh, I believe you showed a consultancy slide and then Kobe, you know, you may want to weigh in as well on, on what, uh, what your, you know, what AgriWeb's tools can do to help with that. But um, John, we'll start with you if you want to weigh in on, I know you showed the cheat grass, but is, have you used other resources or, or been able to identify weeds with some of those same tools or with a consultant? The remote sensing is 
not quite good enough to to nail down specific types of of just general weeds, thistles, and things like that. It will it will kind of help you identify the difference between forbs and things like that, and brush and trees. But but when you really try to drill down between uh, you know what might be um, a weed and what might be a forb that forb that you want to keep it. To my knowledge, it's not quite there yet, but but it does do a good job with perennials and annuals, and it does do a good job with the, the cheatgrass, the invasive annual that we have, and and um, I think the technology is improving all the time. So I think we'll get there. Yeah, and I might jump in as well. Um, we we've been working with a, a lot of companies because I do think, as John mentioned, this is a fascinating portion, satellite imagery when it comes to forage metrics. The guys at Ray's Corn are already starting to do this, and we intend to do uh, work with companies to do the same thing for for the for us forage forage and cow guys. In Australia, where our uh, platform has been around the longest, we've worked with a couple of different companies to integrate that into AgriWeb. And what they do is they take satellite imagery every five days on a 10 meter by 10 meter basis. And then from there project the forage growth between pictures and the amount of forage based off of LIDAR and different sensory designs to project how much forage you have out there. But very exciting uh, sector of the industry when it comes to grazing. Dr. Olson, I didn't want to cut you out of that. If you've had any, uh, you know, seen any of any of your producers using anything like this, feel free to jump in on any of these questions. Absolutely. Unfortunately, um, some of that technology is is still in progress and still trying to be developed. Um, so right now, most of my producers are relying on are relying on county extension agents or other resources, websites to help with identification of, of plants as well as books still. Great, and, and Jerry, this is the one that I might want you to jump in on and, and this is a free for all here. Um, just thinking about all that we've heard now from about probably four administrations <laughs> about uh, promises around expanding uh, you know, resources to rural America related to whether it's broadband or satellite or different uh, tools to get, uh, whether it's mobile service or, or Wi-Fi, et cetera, out to the countryside. Um, maybe just share some of your experiences. Uh, maybe we'll start with John again. John, you mentioned, um, you know, some progress there maybe and having to work around the technologies you utilize at various places on the ranch based on on what's available from from those uh, services. So um, we'll start there. And then, Jerry, I know you're, you know, tuned in as president of NCBA to what's going on in D.C. and what this current administration has planned with that new infrastructure bill. So tell us what you're hearing. Uh, maybe if you want to jump in after John and then we'll just go down the list. Yeah, internet for for virtually everything I talked about tonight, internet is is really important, and, and it's really bad in Elko, Nevada. Um, well, actually, the town of Elko is not too bad, but you don't have to get very far out of it, and and things slow down drastically. I think uh, I think what'll be what'll be okay for us, what'll be good for us is uh, we have we have a fair amount of of cellular coverage you know we're right in the interstate 80 corridor and people that seem to want to get through nevada fast as possible want to do that while talking on their phone so so we have pretty good cell coverage <clears throat> across the across the northern half of the state um, i think that'll only expand and i think looks like you know 4g is fairly fast and 5g will be really fast and i think at least for for places like ours, um, cellular internet will be how we get our internet provided to us. Josh, I think uh, uh, as you alluded to, there is going to be some money in the uh, structure infrastructure bill for rural 
broadband internet. Probably won't be enough money to get broadband internet to everybody. Uh, I know that is also one of the strategic goals of NCBA is to continue to continue to keep that at the at the forefront as we talk to congressmen uh, in Washington D.C. Uh, I'm hopeful. I think there will be some help for some people, but probably not going to be nationwide. Uh, uh, they'll probably look to see how many voters there are in each region, and that'll determine who gets the broadband first, I expect. Uh, but I think we are cautiously optimistic that it will begin to be addressed. Yeah, and one thing that we have run up against uh, when it comes to AgriWeb is there are a lot of places, a lot of places that manage a lot of cattle that do not have internet. So one thing that we have focused primarily on is making the platform usable offline. Uh, so everything that's on the mobile device does not need internet. Uh, and so really when you record records and come in for that cup of coffee or come in to service as you're driving down the road, they'll sync up to the cloud and they'll be preserved in, in uh, the cloud for you to revert back on reporting basis. I also am cautiously optimistic about the private sector jumping in and solving a lot of the problems that we see when it comes to internet service overall. So looking at just what they're doing, whether it's Elon Musk or some other uh, uh, entrepreneur with gumption launching satellites up there to provide internet service for rural America is something that I'm cautiously optimistic will occur hopefully in the next 10 years. Yeah, seeing that uh, new ARC, uh, you know, investment um, ETF launch around space technology, you know, that's that's exciting. I mean, that's a lot of people want to make fun of it, but it's the dreamers that uh, that are willing to go out there and try that'll help us get there. I think so. Um, don't advocate the drug use that Musk does, but I don't mind him spending some of his billions on launching some satellites and giving it a try. Dr. Olson, any thoughts on that and what maybe what some of the challenges you're seeing in, in uh, Texas in this area and maybe some of the progress? Um, so for a lot of our producers, um, internet access is limited or is a challenge, especially in the more rural areas of Texas, whether that's in Southeast Texas or West Texas. Um, that has been a challenge that has become even more apparent during the pandemic as Texas A&M Extension has done much more virtual programming and trying to reach our producers during a pandemic. So that has become even a bigger issue for a lot of our counties. You know, I mean, they still, internet is a, a challenge and it makes very difficult for Extension to reach, to reach our producers um, virtually or provide them you know, information via website or through emails, what have you. So um, that would be beneficial for a lot of people across the state of Texas. Josh, I think too, uh, the use of drone technology is growing in agriculture. And I know we're seeing more and more crop consultants and those kinds of people using it here uh, in our irrigated crops. I know when, where John's at, the country's a lot rougher and tougher. So I don't know how he'd fly one over the mountain, but uh, uh, I think there are. Uh, that also is going to provide, I think, some help and assistance. Uh, I think the camera technology on a lot of those is getting awfully good, and uh, uh, more there could be more uses for that also. Yeah, and we'll talk. We've got some questions about integrating some of these different technologies, so we'll we've got a few questions coming along that that line, or or maybe one that we can branch off of. But before we get there, I think uh, you know the. The elephant in the room question, Kobe, is how much money for that cool tool? Uh, that, that's what inquiring minds want to know. So maybe a scenario with, with various heads of cattle, maybe give us a little breakdown, maybe for a three to 500 head operation and then maybe scaled up. I know you guys are focused initially on much larger operations. So um, where is that, that uh, point that it may become economical to, for somebody to try this out? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that this is not to be a prohibitive type of cost structure for any producer, whether you have 10 head or you have 10,000 head. Uh, our whole mantra is to live for the ranchers. 
Uh, and I can give you a couple of benchmarks. So we have our, our pricing published, our initial pricing published in the US um, on our website. So you can go there and visit just to see uh, what prices we have right now. That will likely change as we focus for every rancher that they may just have a couple of head in the backyard. Overall, as of right now, we try to price uh, a lot of our solutions right between the, the $2 and $5 a head mark. It's not charged on a per head basis, but it's something that we want to be a, a tool for profitability as opposed to a, a hindrance on someone's success. Great, yeah, that gives us a good rule of thumb to think through. So back to the integration piece, and sorry to put you on the spot there, Kobe, but I think you knew that was coming. Um, so the the question that's specific in here is back to Google Earth, John, and and it I know that you've been able to really leverage that technology and do some add-ons. But um, and Kobe, you know, after that question came in, you showed how you were integrating the uh, the free tool as well. So. Um, thinking about the drone technology, you know, capturing imagery in various ways, whether it be through a satellite or through a drone, um, and then also potentially even some of that, you know, trail cam footage, or maybe uh, you were talking about the gates being shut, Kobe. Uh, maybe John and Kobe and, and Vanessa, you know, talk about how you've seen the integration of some of these technologies work in your own experience and and maybe get to some of these questions I'm getting uh, online here. You bet. So uh, Google Earth really meshes well with with just about everything, and I think I think you know uh, Kobe Kobe kind of adds on to it and and makes it more valuable. But some of the things that some of the things that have worked for me is uh, you know you you. You either have a GPS on your phone or or carry a dedicated GPS with you, and you can make waypoints for a new potential fence or or water development or whatever kind of spot that you want to mark, and you can you can bring that fairly easily into your into your Google Earth and and build it as part of your map and and then keep records about it there or or make modifications to it there if you're you know if you created a tr track for a fence line you can you can modify it there um, you can store pictures there of your improvements you know some of the some of the well shots that i showed i actually store on google earth so that it's the best way to kind of remember what's there you know as far as we well, yeah there's ten thousand gallons of storage there or whatever Whatever kind of thing that you want to might keep track of that way, um, and and maybe one of the most important things for me is that it's a great way to share things that I need to share. So I can, whenever you save a file in Google Earth, it's a KMZ or KMZ KML. That's extension file extension. You save that file, then you can share that with with maybe an agency person or or. A, contractor and they can see what you're seeing and you don't have to worry about you know snail mailing or faxing or drawing maps or whatever it is that you want to share you can easily do that through email and and, and then they can manipulate it and add on to it and, and share it back with you so those are kind of some things for me before we go to to uh our other presenters, another question came in related to this for John, and that was, when did you start? You know, it seems like you've really become adept at using this tool. How long have you been engaged using uh, Google Earth? And then you sort of have maybe a little bit of a timeline for how long it took you to figure out some of these uh, these details and, and how to really utilize it. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So. Gosh, time time gets away from me, but I'll bet uh, I'll bet five seven years, maybe maybe even ten years that I've been using it. Um, I actually I actually took a class because because I'm a thick headed cowboy. I actually took a class that helped me quite a bit figure some of the tools out with it. But but really, you know, um, it's fairly straightforward. You you play around with it. You you learn it fairly quick. Um, 
I'll, I'll bet the learning curve for me was was really less than a month. I think in a month, a month into it, I was as good then as I am now. So it, it goes pretty fast and pretty easy. Great, thanks. Dr. Olson, why don't we go to you, let you have a shot at this uh, on integration, maybe some of the unique things you've seen or that was a good point by John on, you know, how many of your folks are sharing some images with you through these technologies or are you still uh, having to drive out to the ranch? Um, unfortunately, I, I probably have very few producers that are using a lot of these technologies. Um, a lot of, especially in East Texas, a lot of my producers are small landowners. And as more folks um, out of Dallas and Houston and San Antonio are retiring and, and buying property in places like East Texas um, that have no agricultural background, we're still in the process oftentimes of educating producers, especially new producers, about some of the different resources and different tools that can help them. So I'm constantly sharing um, and giving presentations and talking about tools like the WebSoul survey and a lot of folks that's still new to them. Um, so I'm not as familiar with how many producers are using some of those tools like Google Earth or WebSoul survey, even though we, we try to introduce those to them as an excellent tool to, to learn more about their property, to measure fence rows, to even measure ponds. Ponds are very common in East Texas as a water source for livestock, as well as an interest in fishing and managing them for, for aquatic life. So um, I think once you get into more rangeland aspect and, and West Texas, um, there's probably a lot more drone utilization um, in order to evaluate their rangeland and look at brush and percent, percentage of brush coverage and how much, and also keeping track of their livestock on it extremely large eight, um, ranches as opposed to in East Texas. So um, as far as, you know, I'm still having to either potentially travel to farms and ranches in East Texas or county agents are kind of the boots on the ground for me. Oftentimes I get pictures from cell phones and um, I was visiting with a colleague the other day and he had a producer that he actually educated him on the ability to send photos from phone to phone you know, being able to text a, an image from one cell phone to somebody else's cell phone. And so um, I am starting to get more pictures from, you know, through text messages. Um, so that's the progress of technology is a little bit slower on, on my, in my experience so far, but I think there are producers out there that are using a lot of that technology. Um, and they're probably much more experienced producers as opposed to whom I'm often dealing with um, in East Texas sometimes. Great, thanks. Go ahead, Kobe. Yeah, and uh, I, I'm excited about drones just as much as anyone, but I think that there are major productivity steps that we can can take that really have the ability to have huge gains when it comes to the common rancher. I think passing paper and sending letters and trying to communicate over the over phone is a big frustration that a lot of people in our industry have because whether it's my dad drawing a map in the sand or trying to send an invoice over email or over uh, through the mail, it's just a, a very inefficient process. So I would say this first step that a lot of producer, producers should look at when it comes to technology is those small quirks that provide a, a lot of uh, efficiency. Uh, I mean, one thing that my dad always lectures to me about is sweat equity, sweat equity into the operation. There's sweat equity that, that goes with learning web soil surveys that goes with mapping after operation when it comes to Google Earth. What we have done at AgriWeb is try to leverage that sweat equity and leverage the, those technologies that have already been adopted to complement it in our universe. So we import Google Earth maps, we look at the web soil survey and just increase the productivity of your ranch really over a week or so. Uh, another thing that we do is on our platform we have no charge per user we give it free to or we give it to we give unlimited users access to any one operation so if vanessa wanted to jump into agriweb and look at some of her uh her operations that she's advising she can have a login and look at the pasture look at the forage and see if it reflects what she sees in her research 
if John wanted to give it to every ranch hand that he has at his operation, or maybe a banker that looks at weekly or monthly inventory reports, they can give a partitioned access to anyone there and really allow efficiency of communication. So you don't need five phone calls and three letters to get a hold of someone. You can really do it uh, in real time. And then as we look to the next step, as we look to integrate the, this buzzword idea of internet of things, then we're looking at what is the most bang for your buck. Water sensors like game cameras are one thing that we look at integrating with. Um, looking at the satellite imagery that we spoke of would provide a lot of return to a lot of people that focus on grazing. Then we'll look at where that takes us. What are the next steps? Technology is innovating quickly. It's tough to keep up. We don't want to minimize the work today. We want to work with that technology and build on top of the, the shoulders of giants per se. Yeah, that's that's great. That was great answers by everyone. Really stretching our minds to think, you know, think about things in a different way and and um, take some leaps forward in in some of these efficiencies would be uh, would be a great progress for a lot of us. Um, and, and I'm not uh, I'm a little younger than the average age of a rancher, and and some of this still bends my mind as well. So um, closing thoughts. I know we're getting a little long here, but we do have a lot of producers that are hanging with us on the line, really interested in this topic, but we'll just close out with closing thoughts. And if you have any final questions, if you're still on, feel free to uh, type them in and I'll get those to the presenters. Uh, we'll respond via email. Uh, Dr. Olson, why don't we start with you this time and go, uh, go back the other direction. Okay. Um, just, I guess, you know, my closing thoughts are, would be just to remember to, you know, look at all of the possible tools. And there's a lot of technology that we can use to um, be more effective and efficient with our, our grazing or our forage production. There's also a lot of old school tools as far as soil testing, forage analysis um, that still require some of that sweat equity, still require some kind of back pain, um, but can really pay off in the long run and save us a lot of money. And that information can be added and implemented into some of these technologies um, to help us, you know, have an overall impact on our on our, on our farms and ranches. Go ahead, Kobe. Yeah, first and foremost, John and Vanessa, it's been an absolute pleasure to to speak um, after you today. I mean, I think that I'm always curious about how to manage forage, how to manage uh, uh, cattle in different geographies. And I think having the diversity of, of your two uh, knowledge banks is, is especially appreciated on my end. I learned a lot in this demo at, or in this webinar, just like everyone else. Secondly, I'm just going to build on top of what Vanessa says, similar follow-ups. I think that your grazing protocols depend on a multitude of things. It has to align with your environment. It has to align with, with the type of cattle you run. It has to align with, with a lot of different proponents. And most importantly, it needs to align with your pocketbook. Do not splurge a ridiculous amount on infrastructure. Do not splurge a ridiculous amount on anything that doesn't have an ROI. Uh, following it. So that's probably one of my um, my biggest takeaways and, and, and final thoughts. I think that producers are, are incredibly uh, great to speak with. If you have any questions, reach out to me. But overall, I'm incredibly optimistic on where the U.S. beef industry is going, incredibly optimistic on what sustainable uh, operations look like in regenerative agriculture as a whole. I might be um, uh, a, a contrarian in that environment, but looking at uh, the individuals that we speak to on a day-to-day -day basis, the people lead the way for the industry, and I think that that's great. So the beautiful part about going last is I can just say, yeah, what they said. It was very well said by both of you. I appreciate being with you. Um, Google Earth, if you're interested in Google Earth, you can you can start tonight. You can download it for free. You can you use it for free. Um, you can start figuring out your your farm or ranch on it. And I I am looking forward to convention. I hope to see you there. And and if I can help you there, I I absolutely would. Um, thank you for having me. It was great to be with you.
Thanks, everybody. Great webinar tonight, and hope everyone has a wonderful evening, and we'll talk to everyone soon. Thanks again.